good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jack Lazarczak, and I'm a developer at Chariot Solutions. Uh, from the Equifax data breach that affected almost 148 million people to someone scraping your Facebook data to sell you very oddly specific t-shirts, cybersecurity concerns take a lot of different forms. It's difficult enough to know if you're protecting your personal data, but as application developers, how, do we, how can we make sure no one can do anything malicious on the software that we've created? It's impossible to know if you've handled every single vulnerability, so what's the answer? Stop making software and go back to good old paper and pencil? Rename all my database tables and classes after ice cream flavors to confuse the evildoers? Ask them nicely not to hack my system? I'm hopeful that our next presenter can shed some light on this issue and relieve some of my anxiety. Here to talk to us about some interesting ways you can add some protection to your, I to your apps is iOS developer Rob Napier. And before I hand things over to Rob, I just wanted to take a quick second to thank uh, Rob, the sponsors, and everyone watching today. Uh, though it's unfortunate, you know, we can't meet in person, I've, I've still had a great time doing this and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. So uh, thank you to everyone, Rob included. Now uh, over to you, Rob. Thanks. So I'm Rob Napier. Um, this is Secrets and Lies. In 1942, the United States Marines enlisted 29 Navajo speakers to send secure messages over the radio. Uh, eventually, there were 421 of them speaking, uh, serving in World War II, the Korean War, and part of the Vietnam War. Their secret code was more or less speaking Navajo, uh, with some very, very basic substitutions thrown in to spell things. Why Navajo? because almost nobody outside of the Navajo Nation spoke Navajo or anything like it. It's a really obscure language. In 1942, they estimated uh, maybe 30 non-native non speakers knew it. Uh, it has complicated grammar and uncommon consonant sounds. There wasn't a writing system until no, nearly 1940, um, so there weren't any books you could study. And Navajo is the most famous, but there were all, it was true of a lot of uh, Native American tribes. Uh, there were Hopis, there were Cherokees, and others all doing the same thing. This was the ultimate security through obscurity. Also in 1942, um, the pinnacle of German cryptography was the Enigma engine, which had been in use for about 20 years at that point with numerous iterations and improvements. The Enigma was what we call security by design. Uh, while they didn't tell anyone you know, how it worked, the design was such that the only important secret was the key. Depending on the model, the operator would program the key into the system by you know, rearranging rotors or patching a plug board. But you know, whatever they did, like any good crypto system, that key was the only important secret. Okay, so we, here we have kind of the ultimate security through obscurity versus the very best security by design of the day. How'd it work out? Well, through three wars, we do not believe the Navajo code talkers were ever deciphered. Through World War II, Enigma messages were actually cracked pretty regularly. Now, uh, I'm kind of glossing over some details, and there are some caveats, but, you know, still. Security through obscurity. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Before I came to iOS, uh, I used to work in information security. That was, that was uh, my career. And I did audits and assessments and penetration testing. And uh, I used to sneak into buildings, talk my way past guards. Uh, I did incident response. I did criminal investigations. Uh, but mostly, my biggest focus was anti-counterfeiting for uh, networking gear. And like all highly trained security people, I was taught Kirchhoff's principle, first published in 1883. In modern terms, we usually don't give it in French anymore. Um, a crypto system should be secure even if everything about the system, except the key, is public knowledge. My preferred way to say it is Shannon's, uh, Shannon's maxim, the enemy knows the system. Or, you know, as we usually throw around, security through obscurity is no security. Hold that thought. Let me tell you another story. Okay, Alfred Charles Hobbs. At the Great Exhibition of 1851 in London, he demonstrated how to pick some of the most advanced locks of the day. He was questioned about whether it was wise <laughs> to demonstrate you know, all the weaknesses of existing locks, since of course that might make it easier for thieves to figure out how to do it. And he quite famously replied, rogues are very keen in their profession and know already much more than we can teach them. 
And this continues to be true today. Um, most door locks are basically pointless. Uh, they can be picked in less than 30 seconds. Um, go to YouTube, search for a lockpick deadbolt. Actually, even better, I've, I've started watching uh, the lockpicking lawyer. You know, just watch his videos and you'll see, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands. Uh, the lockpicking lawyer by himself has many, many hundreds. Um, and that's just by hand picking. And then you get into, you know, lockpick guns and bump keys and lock manufacturers know these problems. And you can spend extra and you can get locks that aren't nearly so easy to pick, but most locks really are. And a lot of institutions have um, what's called a master key system, you know, where you have a regular key um, that will open one door, but a master key that will open all the doors. It's been around for a long time. In 2003, Matt Blaze published this paper on how you could take a regular key and upgrade it to a master key. And it was a pretty easy attack, actually. It didn't require a lot of skill, didn't require a lot of time or equipment, um, and it basically applied to every master key system out there. You know, nothing too surprising there. Vulnerabilities are found all the time in security systems. That's fine. But what was very, very interesting was the reaction from the locksmithing community. A lot of people were really, really angry uh, because Matt had published something that locksmiths had known for over a century. Yes, this vulnerability had been around for a hundred years and no one had fixed it. Locksmiths knew, thieves knew, but people who buy locks did not know. Rogues are very keen on their profession. Security through obscurity is no security, but this is actually a lie. Or at least it's not completely truthful. There is a big difference between these two stories. In the first, the Marines were using obscurity as a tool we had good or at least pretty decent cryptographic ciphers in World War II. Why did we use Navajo and other native languages instead of cryptos, proper cryptography? Because it was faster. It was a lot faster. Uh, encrypting documents to send over the radio took, with, with proper military codes, took a really long time. And you needed to send the message right now in the field uh, under sometimes difficult conditions. And a Navajo speaker could just translate it in their head. So they were making a conscious trade-off in a case where speed was more important than the absolute security of the system. In the case of locks, on the other hand, manufacturers and locksmiths kind of just didn't want to redesign the locks. Um, and they wanted to keep the locks cheap. They wanted to keep them easy to rekey. Uh, they wanted to make it easier on locksmiths. Um, we know, and they knew, how to build locks that are much, much more pick-proof but they tend to be even more expensive and they're harder to rekey. Um, software companies are the same way. Uh, they'd rather keep the vulnerability secret than have to ship a new version that they can't really charge for because it's just a security patch. Um, or they, in many cases, uh, and you see this in the IoT world in particular, they don't want to take on all of the expensive work and possibly cost in, in the product to make it secure in the first place. And instead, they kind of just hope nobody notices. Obscurity is a tool. It is not a particularly powerful tool, or is certainly not as powerful a tool as cryptography, but that doesn't mean it has no place. And today we're going to kind of take a trip through the badlands of security and um, learn a little bit about the you know, discredited and the disparaged. And uh, we're going to talk about obfuscation. I keep using obscurity and obfuscation kind of interchangeably, but they're not really the same. Ob obscurity just means I don't tell anyone how it works. Um, Navajo was obscure. Uh, obfuscation means I actually take efforts to make it hard to reverse engineer. Um, but they're kind of related. Both of them, however, are very, very different than cryptography. In cryptography, there is some secret that is held, importantly, outside the system. Now, the most common form of that secret is a password, and we store that password in someone's brain. Um, there are other things it could be, but the basic rule, if you're an app developer or a client developer of any kind, um, is that if your app can decrypt something and the user doesn't have to help, you probably haven't actually encrypted it. 
if you take the key and put it in your app, the fact that you're using AES doesn't make it encryption. What you've done, there's a technical term for it, it's called scrambling, right? You're just make, mixing it up to make it hard to read, but there's no secret because all of the information required to unscramble it is in the app. You're just kind of hoping that people don't go and look inside the box. Obfuscation is the process of making it harder to look inside that box, but really a lot of it is just hope. Cryptography, on the other hand, makes very strong provable claims, literally mathematical claims about the security of a system based on usually highly, highly technical and mathematical definitions of secure. Um, just as an example, they look like this. This actually comes out of my notes when I was studying cryptography. And this is how cryptographers talk about security and think about security. The, the question this whole homework assignment is, is working out is, um, whether a particular algorithm conforms to the definition of a pseudo random permutation, which is a very technical definition for whether or not it can be determined whether the, its output is from the permutation or is random. Nothing in all of this has anything to do with actually cracking any messages. You can, in the, in the cryptography world, you can completely destroy a crypto system literally by knowing that it's encrypted. The fact that I can tell you that you're sending me ciphertext versus random garbage, you, that's enough. Your whole crypto system is dead. I, I can tell the difference between the two. That's not usually how we in the rest of the world think of security. Real world security doesn't often care about these definitions or doesn't directly care about them. Uh, be, having a cryptographically secure cipher doesn't protect you against all kinds of attack. Um, sometimes the key can be gotten by, you know, other means. Uh, and some uh, algorithms that completely fail the, the security system I was talking about before, uh, uh, pseudo random permutations, um, can be totally fine for certain purposes. The difference between security and obscurity is that when someone figures out the password for your crypto system, for a proper cryptographic system, like say AES, someone getting your key doesn't break AES. Everyone else who's using AES is fine. But when someone figures out your obfuscation system, then everyone else who's using the same obfuscation system is broken as well, because there's no secret. That's the difference. Practical security is really just risk management, right? And the common way that we talk about risk management is raising the bar. I, I kind of hate the phrase raising the bar. I mean, it's great advice, but um, it often gets used in really pointless ways. The idea is that if you raise the bar enough, then attackers will go somewhere else. Uh, as I said, most door locks are kind of pointless, right? They're very, very easy to circumvent, sometimes in seconds. Um, and frankly, if you have windows uh, right beside your door, why would you bother locking your door, right? There's a window right there that I could just break. Um, but you do it anyway, uh, kind of because you hope that if the thief tries the door and it's locked, they'll move on to the next house. And you're probably right. Uh, there's an old joke. Uh, I don't have to be faster than the bear. I just have to be faster than you. Um, but raising the bar only makes sense if you know what's hard and what's easy. And uh, I often like to talk about things like if I have a three inch fence and I say, I want to make it a six inch fence to make to raise the bar. You have done nothing, nothing. There is no group of people who would have stepped over a three inch fence, but won't step over a six inch fence. On the other hand, going from no fence to a three inch fence actually does. There are groups of people who, even if you just posted a sign that says, keep up the grass, that will get them to stop doing it. So there is a, there's a value, but doubling the height of the fence doesn't do anything. I mean, going from three to six inches, it doesn't matter. You need to be thinking usually not in doubling. You need to be thinking in terms of orders of magnitude. Cryptography is often in, you know, we, we think about things in, by adding a hundred times, you know, a thousand times, a, a billion times harder. But again, you can only know what this means if you know what's hard and what's easy. There are bots that download literally every free app on the App Store at, and uh, at least some of the pay apps. And they automatically crack them on jailbroken devices and they scan them for security vulnerabilities, plain text keys, API tokens, passwords, whatever. They're the equivalent of walking down the street, trying all the doors and just seeing what's unlocked. Um, this is an attack that every app faces. Uh, Google Play Store is the same way. Uh, if you have secrets lying around your app, you should assume that they are known. And let's see what the kind of things that those basic, basic tools would in fact give us. 
right? Um, strings. So strings is this little Unix tool, one of my favorites, a uh, very simple one. It just looks for ASCII strings, like sequences of things that decode into random ASCII, into ASCII, right? It's the first thing I run. And um, its default is four characters. This little dash N8 is, uh, says only give me strings that are eight characters or longer because it gets rid of some of the, the garbage. Um, but uh, even in a trivial app, you're going to get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these strings. But that's OK. That's OK. Because it's very, very easy to write a script that filters out, say, in the iOS, iOS world, you want to filter out all the Objective-C and Swift symbols, right? And look for you know, what I'd call interesting strings. And again, this is a very, very simple script. Um, and using that kind of thing, I can quickly find, if you look at the slide, uh, you know, that's an interesting URL. Uh, and probably some kind of password, uh, maybe an AWS token, uh, some base64 data. That's often interesting to maybe poke around with. Um, why, did, why is it in base64? Um, so I'm just talking about strings and a little tiny Python script. Um, I can create a dump of every possibly interesting thing for a human to look at later. And I can make a database of when I find API keys that look like like S3 storage, right? Maybe later when I want S3 storage that I would like to build to someone else, I have a nice database of ones to try. A lot of modern hacking, and I use hacking almost in you know, the loosest terms, is just this. They just scan everything and they look for easy targets, right? It's walking down the hall, trying to find the doors that are unlocked and it's not glamorous, it's not spycraft, it's not warfare. Um, for a lot of you, it's going to be your most common attack, uh, automated scripts. So what's the goal? Just lock the door. So we're going to talk later about how we might just lock the door enough to get the bots to move on. Let's say the attacker is trying just a little harder and they're actually interested in your app, not, not random maps, but they're willing to spend a little bit of time on your app. Now, what, might, what kind of tools do they have readily available? This, uh, this one on the slide is my favorite reverse engineering, engineering tool. It's called Hopper. Uh, it's 100 bucks. It's a decent disassembler, decompiler, and debugger. Uh, if you have the money, uh, what you would get is the gold-plated premium beautiful tool called Ida Pro, uh, which can uh, debug iOS apps directly on the device. It has an excellent decompiler. Uh, but that thing costs thousands of dollars. Um, I don't attack systems professionally. I defend systems professionally. So I use Hopper. Um, but what does it look like um, when you pull up something in Hopper? Well, as you see, I can quickly pull up all the symbols so I can poke around. Um, the strings, just like in the strings file, uh, I can get a, this kind of helpful disassembly. Adds a lot of comments for me. Tells me, you know, how things are laid out. I can create a kind of a calling structure, kind of uh, organize and find my way around. But I tell you, 90% of the time, I go from searching in the symbols straight to this, which is this, this kind of pseudo Objective-C decompilation. This is Swift code, even though it kind of looks like all the square brackets makes it look like Objective-C. Um, welcome to how Swift works. Um, if you look at this, so you see there's like foundation, URL request, bridge to Objective-C, load request. You can tell this is, this is clearly a system built to, uh, this is some web loading code. So that would help me figure out where I want to look around to find where do you load things off the internet, and then I, how would I attack that? Um, Swift does optimize out a lot of a lot of things. A lot uh, Objective C is going to make this incredibly easy. I mean, uh, trying to protect Objective C is is a fool's errand. But um, but but don't think that Swift is is much easier. And Java, of course, also is very very uh, easy to pull a lot of this stuff out. Uh, compiled languages like C and Object and, and Swift and the like get some advantages. But again, everywhere they touch the operating system, they wind up making lots of very obvious calls. Um, so what do we do? I mean, these are just the simple tools. These are really, really easy tools. Um, hopefully that makes you just that much worried. So let's think about what we can do to, to fix it. The first thing you got to do is get the secrets out, right? Avoid sensitive strings in the first place as much as you possibly can. Get them out of your app. That is best. I mean, like, you know, 
if you can make a string that is not in your app cannot be found by something scanning your app. Seems basic, but sometimes it didn't say it. Um, if you're storing sensitive API keys for third party services, this is the most common thing I see people like they have an S3 key or they have a, 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 map, a mapping API of some kind key. They have all these keys they stick in their app. And I'm saying, don't do it. Just don't. Uh, if you don't want people to steal your S3 keys, your S3 bucket keys, and start using your buckets for random stuff, don't put the S3 key in your app. Well, what do you do instead? Instead, what I, like, what I like to do as much as possible is route the traffic to my own servers. Uh, I route a lot of traffic to my own servers, and then I route from there to whatever the backend service is. And if you do that, if you will talk to your own services, right, then you keep control. You can change the keys. If the keys get do leak in one way or another, you can change them. Also, when you decide to change service providers, you decide to change your backend service, you can do that without, and so there are lots of non-security things that it's a benefit. It also lets you monitor for abuse. It lets you see what's going on in your app. It's not all happening you know, outside of your infrastructure. Uh, I often build up little lambdas, you know, I, I use Amazon a lot, and you know, you build up a lambda that's just gonna forward those messages along. And I can control the API that comes in, and then I talk to the third-party services uh, directly from the, server, from the service, or from the server. Um, additionally, if your user has a login, getting your user to log in gives you even more control, right? One of the, you cannot authenticate a, uh, an app. Uh, this is one of the most common questions that I run into on Stack Overflow and security is, uh, I wanna make sure that only my app can talk to my server. That is not possible. You, cannot achieve, you can never achieve that um, because the app has all the secrets in it and people will pull the secrets out. You can, however, authenticate users because users have passwords that the system doesn't know. And then you can cut them off. If, they, if they're abusing the system, you can get rid of their, or close down their account. I, I understand not everybody can do that, but still, that is where the direction, uh, you always, you will never be able to solve it by trying to authenticate the app or figure out a way that only your app can talk to your service. Now, you can go the other direction. I say, you know, take all the secrets out. There's another trick, it's called um, uh, honey tokens. And what, um, and what you do is you put secrets in that are lies. The idea is you have this fake credential. Right, a fake login or a fake URL uh, that isn't part of your system. It does, it doesn't, it's not allowed. But the fact that somebody tried to use it tells you that something's happening. Someone has clearly, uh, because they showed up at this URL and this URL is nowhere except in the app, you know they scanned your app. And so at least that can tell you some, some information. Um, so that is another thing. I will say this tends to be a more advanced thing. I don't usually do that because it's more trouble than it's worth, but it does help you figure out what's going on. And I have seen, I've had customers who use it. No matter how you do these things, however, one of the common things I say is it can tell you if something's going wrong. But in order for that to work, you have to be paying attention. You have to monitor your logs. If you don't pay attention, if you don't know how people are using your system, then you can't see if they're misusing your system. And then you can't defend yourself. One of the most common uh, situations is you suddenly will have an emergency and you go, ah, you know, I'm being hacked. And you go and look at your logs. And I've done this, I've done a, quite a lot of, of security investigations and gone and look at logs. And I promise you, everything you look at your logs will look like you're being attacked. Uh, normal logs look weird. Normal logs, everyday stuff looks like attacks. Um, so the only way that you're going to be able to know what's normal is if you look at your logs regularly. When, you're, when you feel you're not being attacked, or at least you feel that you know, this is a normal period in time, then you can compare that to what it looks like uh, when, you, when you know that there is a problem. You'll be able to tell the difference. All kinds of weird, I, I've had things like, I've had backups. Uh, backups ge often generate the kinds of logs that feels like somebody's scanning your system because it touches every file on the system. And suddenly all the, the access states are all changed. Um, I, I had that in, in one security investigation. So again, I, I encourage you, go out, look at your systems before. Okay, okay. We've talked enough about all, that's all kind of the setup. Let's actually hide some stuff. Um, yes, you should get all your secrets out, but sometimes you can't. Um, you can put fake stuff in, but, but let's take a real secret and let's hide it. 
Why not? Okay, let's talk about base 64. You should never, never, never store sensitive information in base 64. There is no reason to. There's never a reason to store in base 64. It is worse than any other solution. Um, the point of base 64 is to encode raw data, right? Um, raw bytes, like random bytes that you couldn't make a string out of. Well, then just store the raw data, right? So, I mean, let's say we have this key. Instead of making a string that's going to show up really, really easily in my, you know, strings output, um, and it's just random data, I could, I could just turn it into raw bytes. How do I do that? I decode the base 64, and I pass it to one of my favorite tools, which we will see several times today, XXD, which is a, uh, a hex dumper. This is on Mac. Uh, I think most Linux systems have it, too, um, built in. And the dash I says, please dump it out so that I could put it in an include file. It's designed specifically for um, C, but uh, it happens to be exactly the same syntax for just about everybody. So I'll put it this way. And boom, it's data. Right? Now it's not in the strings list anymore. Now it doesn't show up as this, as this very interesting thing, at least in that way. But this is what it looks like. Uh, another one of my favorite tools, otool-d. Uh, this works on Mac. Um, and it dumps the data section. And most of the data section is usually zeros. Lots and lots and lots of zeros because uh, it's for uh, uh, initialized uh, global variables, uh, lazily initialized global variables. Um, so s actual static data stands out very blatantly. So it's better than a string, but it's certainly, we've, we've taken one step. We're going to come back to this and show how to make it even better. But at least we got to have a string, and we got to have a base64. Um, what if you really do have an ASCII string, right? I mean, then what? I mean, it, it, I mean, the thing is an ASCII string. Like, I have, I have this thing, some key. This key is horrible. Um, I'm looking at this, and I'm like, there's 32 letters here, 32 characters. The only reason anyone writes exactly 32 characters is because they have an AES 256 key. Well, that's wrong. If you can type an AES 256 or an AES key, you've done something wrong. Um, AES is built around, the security of AES is built around the fact that the keys are random, totally random, completely, completely random over 32 random numbers from 0 to 255 with uniform distribution. If the moment you start putting structure of any kind into the key, you're undermining AES's entire point. So how should you create an AES key? You should read 32 bytes out of dev random, right? And again, we can stick them into xxd-i, and now we have a key. Um, and this is a proper AES key. And this is a much, 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 much stronger. And you don't have to worry about strings again. Again, I don't have, to, I don't have these strings. How much stronger, when I say stronger, I mean 100 trillion times stronger. Trillion, yeah, that, that is, there are 100 trillion more times, more 32 byte sequences than 32 character sequences that you could type, right? This is where cryptography gets its power. Cryptography is all about enormous, enormous key spaces. that are so big, you can't possibly search them all. But you lose that when you don't use random keys, when you start having keys that you can type. Um, it should just never be one. It should have no structure. The only structure should be, it has to be 32 bytes, so it's 32 bytes. And if you absolutely must put it in your code, sort as a data. Ideally, you shouldn't put it in your code at all. Uh, we'll, and we'll get to some of that. Um, the other nice thing is, of having raw bytes rather than even some funny long sequence of things that you've typed. Um, we used to do this uh, when I was a system administrator. We, we really wanted random passwords, even passwords that you would log into systems. Um, because when someone looked over your shoulder at when you were forced to put it, you know, in some document or in the code or anything else, you, people would, uh, people can memorize that. There are definitely people who can memorize 32 random numbers, but that's a much smaller group who can glance over your shoulder and memorize 32 random numbers. So it's kind of nice. Okay, but what about real strings? Real, real strings. We can't fix this one, right? This is an API key. You know, this is kind of a AWS style key. Um, 
I can't fix it because they really are 20 ASCII values. And turning it into data doesn't fix anything because the data values are still ASCII values and they'll show up in, string, or in strings output exactly the same. Does you, does you no good to turn this into quote data. Um, now, one thing is I, again, I'm saying, please don't put this in your code. Please fetch it from, uh, either go through your server or fetch it from your server that again, the least would allow you to change it and, or would allow you to, um, um, uh, it allows you to change it, but also means it can't be found in scanning. But let's say you can't do that. You really, you're gonna have to put this 20 bytes that are ASCII in your code. What do we do? Let's do something. Now, this is real obfuscation. And this is kind of the simplest stuff. This is really the simple ways to do obfuscation. Now, don't scribble any of this down. Uh, I have a GitHub site at the end um, that, that has this. It has a tool called Swift Mask that uh, if you're working in Swift, it'll actually write the code for you. Um, but what techniques do we use? Well, we create a mask um, that is the same length as the API key. Read it from dev random, right? XSD, always my favorite. Put it in data, da da. And now we need a masking function. And our masking function is going to be XOR. And the great thing about XOR, XOR is a function that when you apply it to two bytes, you get another byte that when you XOR that, again, you get, the, you get your original back out, right? It's, it's a nice reversible thing. In fact, it's what a lot of cryptography is built on. Um, so we're just gonna take the actual API and mask it with totally random data. This is called a one-time pad. Uh, if we didn't store, the, now, this is not, nothing I'm describing here is strong because we're gonna put this key in our, in our program. But if we didn't, this is in fact the strongest possible secure uh, cryptography. It's called a one-time pad. It is, is provably unbreakable. Um, this is breakable because we're gonna stick it in our, in our code. But that's gonna spit out a new piece of data. Now we have two pieces of data in our real program, neither of which is an ASCII string and neither of which is actually the secret. So that's nice, right? Even if somebody finds one of them, you need to put them together. And how do we put them together? We just apply XOR again. The little carrot is XOR in Swift. Um, and they'll give me back my string. Now, of course, you could do something a little trickier than XOR. There's some other, you know, you could, you could try to mess with it in, in other ways to make it just a little more complicated. But frankly, you're probably just going to confuse, you're just going to make it confusing and not get a lot of benefit out of it. XOR is probably enough, um, but you can do anything you want. The whole point here is that you're going to generate, though, using totally random data, you're going to generate other things that are not strings. Now, remember from earlier, though, when I take all these things and I stick them in the code, they're going to stand out really bad because they're going to be, like in the case of an AAS string, it's going to be exactly 32 bytes. And I promise you, when I hack programs, when I find 32 bytes, I know it's an AAS key. This is always is, right? Especially surrounded by a bunch of zeros. So what we wanna do is make it so that's not so obvious. Um, now, where did that come from? It comes from writing the code like I showed you to write before. So what's the first thing we could do? Well, we could hide it a little bit in just a little more code, in more data, all right? So let's just generate some garbage, right? And I generate two blocks of garbage and I stick some of the block at the top and some of the block at the bottom. And then I say, I'm gonna pull these random bytes out, bytes 20 through 51 to get my stuff out. And I just kind of pick those numbers, you know, arbitrarily. And again, this is not strong. People can go through and find, you know, your code and work it out. Um, but it means that basic scanning is, is a lot harder. Now, one funny thing I wanted to point out both of these sequences started with an 8-4. Um, they are random. I actually, they are two different sequences. They both just happened to start with point eight, with, with hex 4 And I actually, when I built this example, I was like, oh no, I'm gonna confuse people. I should change um, the eight, one of them just so, because people are gonna think it's the same sequence or whatever else. I should change it to make it more random. That's, kind of dangerous, about half a percent of the time, two random sequences of bytes will just happen to have the same starting value. I mean, that's just, I mean, is one divided by 256? I mean, that's about half a percent of the time, picking two bytes is gonna be the same byte. It doesn't happen that often, but it's not shocking. I mean, it happens quite a bit. And on a big system, it happens quite a lot. Um, 
And when you try to fix it to make it feel random, what you're really doing is making it not random. And in fact, there's a lot of great history in the cryptography world of crypto systems being broken because folks wanted to, uh, folks made things feel more random. And in doing so, they actually created patterns. Uh, this is how uh, actually some very famous crypto systems were, were broken. Um, so generally, once you've been given random data, if you believe it's random data, leave it alone. It, just let it be random. Sometimes you'll get big strings of zeros and you go, well, there shouldn't be a string of zeros. It's like sometimes it happens. Sometimes you get three zeros in a row or eight eights in a row or whatever. Now, what we really want, what we would, our dream, is that the attacker doesn't even try. The attacker doesn't even know where the secret is. And this is a topic I'm not going to go deep into. I just want you to know the words. Um, there is a whole system called steganography. Um, and steganography is the concept of hiding a message in another message, in an overt message that everybody knows in a way that they don't realize that there is a hidden message. Uh, so the idea isn't to prevent them from deciphering the secret, it's to prevent an attacker from even knowing the secret exists. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't want to dig too deep in, into that, but, it, but these are other ideas. But you probably, if I had to pick something to take away, is like, don't overthink it. Steganography is actually very, very complicated. And I've seen a lot of people go down that road and go, oh, well, we'll do stego. Um, here's the thing. When I was in information security, I, I actually uh, worked quite a bit on uh, anti-steganography tools. Uh, not not the t on using them, on, on actually uh, in an operational way, looking for Stego. Um, and the way that we detect Stego is there are a number of very well-known steganography tools out there. And they leave big fingerprints that let you know you use the Stego tool. Um, I promise you, if you found some tool to obfuscate your program on GitHub, attackers know about it too. And in fact, uh, it will often, I, I very often have found that if you try to use these things that are super clever, they actually just highlight where you're hiding data, right? They, in fact, make it worse than doing nothing. Um, so again, I encourage you, don't overthink it. Some of these simple, just simple stuff, because um, you're probably going to do it wrong anyway. It's really hard to do it right. So keep it simple and don't, you know, waste too much of your time on it. New topic. Okay, scanning for strings, so easy, so easy that you can do with automated scripts. So you should kind of assume that every single program has this problem. Um, but there are other things you can do. I can also uh, uh, sniff network traffic. Um, it's not so easy to automate it completely, um, but it's not that hard. So I'm going to show an example in the simulator, but this works on devices just as easily. Um, I record this as a screen thing so, so that everybody could see it. Um, this is a tool called, the, called Charles uh, on Mac. It's kind of my favorite. Uh, it costs about 50 bucks. Uh, it's available on Mac, Windows, Linux. Um, and I really like it. There are other ones that are free. Uh, Wireshark is probably the most famous. Uh, I use Wireshark extensively when I'm not doing HTTP traffic or if it's not web traffic. Um, but, uh, but, but, but Charles is, is really nice for, for this kind of stuff. Now, how does it work? So say I have this little tool, it, it talks SSL, you know, I'm gonna push a button, it's gonna send a message and it's gonna get a response back, but it's all over SSL. And there it is, I get this connect message um, and that's all I see. It just says, I went to that host, I did a connect and then I get gibberish. And that's all I have. Well, I'm looking at my screen by the way, because I have it playing over here. Um, and I can't tell what, what's happened because the, everything's encrypted, so that's fine. I'm going to then go and install the, uh, the Charles root certificate. Now, this is a system, this is a new, creates a new trusted root. And I'm doing this in the simulators, but it works on devices too. Um, this is a normal thing. This is totally supported. It's used by enterprises all the time. Uh, this is not jail, this doesn't require jailbreaking or anything else. I'm creating a, a certificate that, decrypt, that can decrypt everything that goes through it. And in fact, that's what I'll do here now. I say I'm going to uh, enable SSL proxying for that one thing. And then when I send it, boom, I get the, the whole thing. Again, I want to make it clear, this is not something, now I'm doing, I have to do this to my own device. 
because uh, I'm installing this extra certificate. But the point is, this didn't require jailbreaking. This didn't require hacker tools. This didn't require anything. This is this is a completely supported configuration of most computers and most phones. Um, this is what we call this is a man in the middle attack um, because it creates a place where everything goes through it. It gets decrypted, processed, then re-encrypted and sent to the next. Okay, how do I fix it? Ah, I don't fix it like that. How do I fix it? What do I do about it? Um, Certificate pinning. Now, I'm not going to talk too much on this because I'm not going to give all of this. Uh, I have a link because I have a whole 25 minute talk just on certificate pinning. I just want to set up why you should care about it um, and a little bit of how you would do it on iOS. Um, the main thing is the root store, it's not just that you're trusting random certs that get pushed in, you're trusting a lot of certs. In, um, in uh, I haven't checked again since iOS 11, the last, time I wrote, the last time I looked at it was iOS 11. They had 170 certificates in the iOS root store. 170 different certificates that people are totally universally trusted. If you look at one of those uh, on the right-hand column, you'll see Cisco. I personally helped put that one in the root store. Um, I promise you, it's a very secure certificate. I'm very proud of how we got that one in, but I promise you, you don't need it. There's no reason you need to trust Cisco in order to deal with your normal things. You really only wanted to trust a handful of certificates, kind of your own certificate, but maybe in a broader scheme, the folks that you buy certificates from, uh, VeriSign maybe, or whoever you get your certificates from. So you should only trust those. So what do you do? Well, okay, here's the code. Yeah, it's like a page of code. It's and it's a, it's fiddly and it's a little obnoxious in the iOS world. So, at least over on iOS, I've I've wrapped it all up. I hope to do this over in Kotlin. I I I need to write one of these for Kotlin as well. Um, you just take your certificate, dump it in the bundle, and do certificate validator. And the point of this is to say, I only trust certain certificates. I don't trust every possible certificate. And now it just is, again, raising the bar of making it much harder for an attacker. In order for an attacker now to attack, to follow your traffic, they have to hack your program, which they can do. I mean, they can run it on a jailbroken device, but you're making it so they can't just use trials. They now have to do more complicated things. So again, um, there'll be links uh, at the end to uh, to, like I said, much longer talk on just certificate pinning. Now, when dealing with network services, I also kind of recommend adding secret knocks. Um, for instance, a secret knock is just a random key, and this would be fine to be in base 64 or the like, just some long random thing that has to be part of the API calls. Um, and if it's not, you know, you don't accept it. And it's static, or maybe it's static, or you do something else. But it, the whole idea is that when bots come along and scan your API on the server, they can't, they can't just get in just by pinging you. They don't get nice error messages. I mean, how do you do, I mean, the simplest version of this is literally you just, you just come up with a random token and you just require it in the header of every request. I mean, all of them, authenticated requests, non-authenticated requests, just everything. And if it isn't there, you send back 404. You don't send back 400. You don't send back an error. You don't send back anything useful. You just say nobody's home because if you don't know the secret knock, you shouldn't even be here. Right? So force the attacker to actually reverse engineer your app to figure this stuff out. Right? Don't let them just scan your server and figure out where all your endpoints are. Now, you can of course make these tokens much, much more complicated. I mean, you could hash pieces and you could, you know, you could use timestamps and everything, but you know, you can also start breaking stuff. So keep I tend to say just keep it simple. The, the whole point was just to stop again what we call script kiddies, the, the folks who are just probing everything. Another thing along these lines, uh, folks will say, folks will say, I'll even say sometimes, you know, why would you, why would you encrypt something with AES over a link that is already encrypted with HTTP? That seems silly, but it can be surprisingly effective. True story. Um, I was actually hired to develop a client for this uh, high security API. Um, and they gave me the full source code in Android, like full working client in Android, and I was supposed to build the same system in iOS. Now, 
their system encrypted every request and response. They had a per session key that was used to encrypt everything back and forth. Um, there's actually a, a, an AES key for upstream and a different one for downstream. And um, now the thing is, this was just obfuscation because when you did the connection, they gave you the key, right? It wasn't a secret, it was actually given. But, but here's the thing, if you, as you tried to explore this API, if you, if there was anything wrong with the request, if the encryption was wrong, or if the, um, or the request itself was wrong, if there was any mistake at all, you would not get an error. You would get back a legitimate response that's encrypted and the encryption was gibberish. So you couldn't decrypt it. Now, maybe the problem was that your, in, your decryption logic was broken, or maybe the problem was that your encryption logic was broken, or maybe the problem was that you were actually sending the wrong message. It made it really hard. Um, and again, I, I want to stress, I had a full working version in, in Android. It still took me about 20 hours um, over, you know, most of a week to, to build this client. Now, again, I did build it. I mean, it was, I mean, with dedication, I was able to do it, but I mean, I do this kind of professionally and it, it slowed me down. So don't ever let people tell you that obfuscation cannot work. So what if the attacker is really going to spend some time? I mean, they really actually, they care about your app. You have a serious app. Okay. Um, they're going to like actually put it on a jailbroken device. They're going to, um, uh, you know, try to, try to, try to really attack this app. Um, they're going to modify your app just to skip all your validation checks. Now, what are you going to do? Now, for most of you, not everybody, but for most of you, the answer is absolutely nothing. You, you've actually lost. You're not going to win this. You need professionals to, to help build something. Um, you're, something you come up with over three days that you devote to it is not going to stop them. Um, you, uh, and you're just wasting your time and probably making your app more fragile. Uh, I hate to be depressing. It's, that's just how it is. Uh, but Here's still what I recommend. Attack your own app. Go use the tools we've discussed. Spend a few hours on it, you know, maybe a day. You already know where the secrets are. You know what they are. I mean, don't go searching for the exact secret, but, but poke around. Uh, can you see it? Look at, your, look at your stuff in Charles. Are you sending unencrypted requests? Uh, is your certificate pinning actually working? Uh, archive your app. Open it up in Hopper. Poke around. What do you see? If it's obvious, if you can see these things, again, as a non-expert, then it's being balanced off between you don't really necessarily know what you're doing, but also you already know where all the secrets are, right? And so that balances off a bit against someone who does know what they know they're doing, but doesn't know where the secrets are. So just give it a try. One little, um, one little magic uh, thing. Uh, you can use deb you can use Hopper to do debugging um, it, it, on the simulator, but not on devices. And in order to do that, what you you'll need to do is this kind of thing, where you you actually have to tell the simulator. If you if you're an iOS developer, you probably are familiar with things like Sim Control. But you can do a Sim Control and say, "Don't run the app until the debugger attaches." It took me a long time to figure that out. That's what you had to do in order to to debug from the very beginning, but so I give you that. Um, again, you play around with it. You see what, what you see. If you can see it, then I promise you they can. Um, the one thing, again, uh, I, I said something along this line before. I want to reiterate it. You should not add a bunch of things that you think will hide your secrets without actually going and looking what they do in the real output. Um, I've run into just too many obfuscation tools, especially on GitHub. You know that you, that actually make things worse, right? They do not hide the data at all. They just make it blazingly obvious that this was an important secret key. Um, so I, I'm just saying, bad obfuscation can be worse than nothing. You have to go look and see if it's doing anything. Uh, also, Swift uh, things like Swift can can um, sometimes the optimizer will fix things for you. So you think you're hiding it by you know jumbling it up, and Swift will actually see oh. I can just do all that math at compile time and put the final result in back into your binary. You have to watch out for that stuff. 
Okay. What about obfuscation tools, right? I mean, where you're actually going to spend some money. I mean, professional stuff. Okay. Here's the thing. Uh, first, I would do want to say, ob trying to obfuscate Objective C is between pointless and buggy. Uh, there's like you're just not going to get anywhere. You're just going to make um, you're just going to inject bugs uh, because in Objective C things need to have specific names. Um, that can be kind of true in other languages too. Um, I'm not as familiar in JavaScript, uh, but but I would still be. I, you just have to be very very careful um, in any language that can construct the names of things because you can't change those easily. Um, Swift is a little easier. Obfuscating Swift, though, at the end of the day, um, it interacts with Coco a lot. And so it's going to have all kinds of things that are tied to names uh, that you can't change. Uh, interface builder, key value coding, uh, core data, you know, all these things. But OK, let's say you do change the names of things, right? There are things you can. The thing is, when you do reverse engineering, names aren't necessarily the most important part. Um, so looking at this code, um, this is, you know, I've, I've, I've changed all the names. I pulled, I, I did minification. I pulled everything down to, you know, A, B, and C. But I think most iOS developers would immediately know what this code does, right? You don't need the names to know what it does. Now, in fairness, it wouldn't look like this after even the most basic obfuscator. It would look maybe a little more like this, right? Where, you know, there's not oral session, there's, you know, O20 or whatever, right? There's all this stuff. And so, but again, while it looks like this in the source code, that's not what it looks like when you pull up, say, Hopper. When you pull it up in Hopper, it's effectively, it doesn't literally look like this, but it effectively looks like this. You get all the types back. Because in Swift, and uh, I believe this is mostly true in Java as well, you have to have the types. I mean, it's part of the language. Uh, I mean, it's part of how the runtime works. Um, so the types actually, while you didn't type them, they are inferred and stored in the binary. So you can get them back. Well, again, I can tell any, again, any iOS developer is going to look at data or all response error and know exactly what function, um, whatever 06 is. And in fact, they're going to then just put in, okay, that's what 06 is and put it through, right? And then you're going to deobfuscate, you know, if that's right, then, okay, the last line is resume because that's always resume. So now... I know throughout the code, O20 is resume, and et cetera. And I can kind of d get back to this kind of thing. It's not quite the original code, but it's awful close. And this is what I mean, that things that are trying to obfuscate often are, that are doing it cheaply and easily probably aren't doing a lot. Um, there, are, there is a next level up from that. They typically are a bit more expensive tools, um, but we call it hardening. Um, in hardening, you're not, it's not so much about obfuscation, it's about making it difficult to um, attach a debugger. Uh, there are various techniques you can use to try to just make it hard. Uh, you might, and some of these tools go in and they inject garbage code that never gets run, or they, they, they actually complicate your code. So you're paying usually in binary size, you're paying in bad stack traces in some cases, although they sometimes try to help you get those out, uh, fix those. Um, they usually bad performance. Um, it's a lot of pain, um, usually. And, and you should expect it to be a bit more expensive than you think you should have to pay. And you should expect to be updating it regularly. Because if you're not updating it regularly, attackers are always getting better. They're always finding new things. And any good piece of obfuscation software has to constantly be keeping ahead of that. Um, if, you're, if, if it was like, I could just sprinkle it on and it worked, then it, everybody's just going to work that backwards. Um, I do not use these for the most part. I, I have, but I, I almost always work to get them out because I, I don't find them worth it. I can imagine cases where they'd be it. And you have to make your own choices. Really, that's what this is all about. I mean, it's cost benefit. Security is this kind of logarithmic scale. And all I'm trying to do is get you from terrible, terrible, terrible security to, you know, just basic security. Getting up to, you know, pretty good is a lot <laughs> of work. Um, and so really, today's talk has been, you know, the outcast of security and uh, obfuscation. And there's a reason that it's the outcast. Cryptography is orders of magnitude better. Obfuscation is fragile. It requires ongoing maintenance. It is a non-stop 
um, iteration of getting better, of, of, of dealing with attacks and fixing them. But some problems don't lend themselves to cryptography and some problems don't have anywhere safe to store their secrets. So we kind of hide and hope. I hope what you do after the conference, go back, um, do the following. If you're using obfuscation today to protect customer data, then you have to stop that. that it, it cannot be made to work. You need to protect customer data with um, cryptography. There has to be a secret, uh, ideally known only by the customer. Um, but if you're protecting your data from your customers, which is usually what people are asking about, um, people who you allow to download your app, but then you want to control what they do. Um, it is not winnable, but if you want, but if you need to go down that road, then you need to make sure you're not just leaving secrets on the table. Start the basics, compile your app in release, you know, full release IPA in the Swift world uh, and run strings on it. Look for keys, look for stuff that you know is a secret. Spend a hundred bucks on Hopper, spend 50 bucks on Charles, spend, you know, a day. Try hacking it, see, see what you find, see what it looks like. Never ever store sensitive data as strings. Um, in, if, if the sensitive data is, is, is in fact in its pr purest form is a string, then split it up with uh, XOR. Another technique you can use is to encrypt it with AES, it, uh, which is also fine. Uh, again, if you use a totally random key with AES. And don't spend more time on this than it's really worth to you. Um, don't let it get in the way of your paying, don't do things that are gonna upset your paying customers. That's secrets and lies. Awesome, thank you so much. That was, that was actually very interesting. I knew about almost none of that. So that was, <laughs> that was really cool, yeah. Um, I mean, we still have about two and a half minutes. I don't know if anybody uh, has any questions. Uh, they can ask them in the room B Slack I'll be on channel. the, yeah, I'll be on. Uh, okay, cool, so you can then. And I'll be, I'll be there later as well, so. Okay, okay, Everybody awesome. Um, and I was, like if people had enough kind of questions, you know, I. For other talks, if people have kind of wanted to continue the conversation, I've created a separate Slack channel uh, just because the kind of rooms get a little bit, you know, uh, chaotic at yeah, times. Yeah. But so if you'd like me to do that, I, you know, I can absolutely. Abusing your traffic using key. I, I do want to respond. Well, other than someone abusing your traffic using a key, what other kinds of hacks can happen? Um, well, I mean, it's usually abusing, you know, it's not just with a key, it's any type of abuse of your system. Um, one of the most common problems I've seen people run into, though, is things like, say, a mapping app that you pay by the request. Um, this is, this is a, often the big place where uh, I really push people to please put the key in, on your server when you have to pay money, where someone else can make use of your service and you pay for it. Um, the hardest is when people use it to abuse high scores. And the truth is, I've never found anybody... That's just an ongoing war, <laughs> and I don't. I unfortunately, I don't think there's there. No one has solved the high score problem. Um, you're just. It's an ongoing fight. <laughs> Thank you so much again. Greatly appreciated yeah. that. Uh, super interesting talk. So, um, yeah, we can just keep the conversation going in this room for now. I think that's probably uh, sure. that's probably good. But yeah, so thanks again. Thank you everybody for watching.